Coming up on Network Africa. Sudan ruling council says all forces must leave Sudan capital Khartoum for truce to hold. Libya expels thousands of Egyptian migrants. And Red Cross in Senegal says over 350 people injured in clashes. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Joker Rogers here in Lagos. We begin in Sudan, where the deputy head of Sudan's ruling council, Malik Aga, has welcomed negotiations for a further ceasefire, but said no truce can hold until all forces are withdrawn from the capital. There's been an alarming escalation of violence in Khartoum and in the western Darfur region since the negotiations in Saudi Arabia broke down last week. Both the army and the rival paramilitary force, the Rapid Support Forces, accuse each other of violating the truce, but negotiations have remained in Jeddah. Mr. Aga says the talks there represented the best hope of ending the fighting. Sudanese military leader General Abdel Fattah al bahan recently appointed Mr. Aga, a former rebel leader, to replace his former deputy, General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemedti, who leads the RSF. Meanwhile, live footage on Sunday showed black smoke billowing above the capital. A resident, Sarah Hassan, described it as a real hell. She said, in southern Khartoum, we are living in terror of violent bombardment, the sound of anti-aircraft guns and power cuts. Among the other areas where fighting was reported were central and southern Khartoum and Bari across the Blue Nile to the north. Witnesses said a military plane had crashed in Omdurman, one of the three cities around the confluence of the Nile that make up the greater capital region. There was no comment from the army, which has been using warplanes to target the IRSF fighters spread out across the capital. Beyond Khartoum, deadly fighting has also broken out in Darfur in the far west of Sudan, already grappling with long-running unrest and huge humanitarian challenges. Witnesses reported that heavy fighting on Friday and Saturday had brought chaos to Khartoum or to Kutum, one of the main towns and a commercial hub in North Darfur. Governor Mini Ako Minawi declared Darfur a disaster zone, covering all its five states, and called for the international community to provide the region with emergency humanitarian aid. Well, Kenya has closed its diplomatic missions in the Sudanese capital as clashes intensify between the rival military forces. Kuril Singoy, Principal Secretary of Foreign Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs, said the mission had remained open to support the evacuation of Kenyan citizens, but was now closed as it had come under threat from the fighting. And also a Chinese envoy called on all conflicting factions in Sudan to immediately cease fire and halt hostilities so as to create conditions for political dialogue to resolve the conflict. In view of the continuing armed conflict in Sudan, UN Security Council adopted a resolution on the extension of the mandate of UN integrated transition assistance in Sudan by six months until December 3rd, 2023. Zheng Shuang, China's deputy permanent representative to the United Nations said that maintaining peace and stability in Sudan is the common aspiration of the international community. Meanwhile, Sudan's warring parties fought in the capital after the collapse of talks to maintain a ceasefire and ease a humanitarian crisis. Residents of Khartoum and Umduman across the Nile said the army had resumed airstrikes and was using more artillery but said that there was no sign of the paramilitary group. The residents also revealed that the rapid support forces were retreating from streets and homes that it had occupied. Seven weeks of warfare between the army and the RSF have smashed up parts of central Khartoum, threatened to destabilize the wider region, displaced 1.2 million people inside Sudan and sent another 400,000 into neighboring states. The result of the voting is as follows. The draft resolution received 15 votes in favor. The draft resolution has been adopted unanimously as resolution 2685. With this resolution, the Council has sent a unified endorsement of the United Nations Integrated Transition Assistance Mission in Sudan, UNITANS. I would like to pay tribute to the efforts of all UN staff in Sudan 
and supporting from outside, who continue to do vital work under extremely challenging circumstances. We put forth common sense recommendations for the mandate to report on the ongoing conflict and support efforts to cease the hostilities. However, other members of the Council did not agree despite the drastically changed and catastrophic circumstances. We hope that the Council can come together in the months ahead and agree on a resolution that more accurately reflects the situation on the ground and empowers the mission to better support an end to the conflict, protection of human rights, unhindered humanitarian assistance, and the resumption of a process to achieve a democratic political settlement in Sudan. And for aid workers, they say fierce fighting, rampant looting, and reams of red tape are hampering Sudan's relief effort. Jean-Nicolas Danglesia, emergency coordinator for medical aid group MSF, says millions of people in need of, are out of reach. At least eight aid workers are among the hundreds of people killed in nearly seven weeks of fighting, while the World Food Program says food for 4.4 million people is at risk after an attack on its warehouses in El Obeid, a city southwest of Khartoum. It has also lost supplies in Sudan worth $60 million. An official from the UN's OCHA, a humanitarian agency, said more than 160 vehicles have been stolen from aid organizations and scores of offices and warehouses have been looted. It has been an extremely difficult environment to work in uh, because we are talking about over a month of uninterrupted fighting with some ceasefire agreements that have been functioning sometimes, sometimes not, and at some point the fighting subsided. But also there's just the general state of lawlessness. The lootings have been widespread and just like the general criminality. And that, of course, or of course, adds a different layer and makes it an extremely volatile and difficult environment to be working in. We need more supplies to uh, be reaching Khartoum and also Darfur. And unfortunately, under the current circumstances, it has been extremely difficult to make sure that those supplies they get from warehouses to where they need to be. Now we're looking at around 40% of the population that will not know where their next meal would come from. Uh, and part of that is because th this conflict has pushed more people into hunger. So as much as we can respond, uh, we are responding and we are providing support, but it's extremely challenging uh, to meet all the needs and to, to reach everyone wherever they are. Let's get more on this. VOA correspondent Mohammed Yusuf joins us from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Mohammed, good to have you today. Thanks for having me. So, what's the current situation in Sudan? We understand that there is an alarming escalation of violence in Khartoum and in Western Darfur region since the negotiations broke down last week. Since the collapse of talks in uh, Saudi Arabia and Jeddah, the fighting uh, has escalated and still continues. And uh, there is, uh, for, the, for the Sudanese, uh, mostly for those who are living in the capital, Khartoum, they're living under aerial bombardment that is taking place. But they're also, but they're also been complaining of heavy, heavy fighting in the streets, heavy bombardment, and many of those sort of things. That is the situation they're living in. More people every day um, are pushed out of their homes. They're, they're, they're unable to, to afford food. And if it is food is available, the market is quite expensive. That is uh, for medical in terms of hospitals. They're also challenging, of course. Some have been able to get uh, some sort of assistance. But uh, um, aid supply has been going on to hospitals, but it's not enough. And there's also fear across uh, many Sudanese that uh, if the fighting continues, that there's no truce, and if there's negotiations that is being pushed by the Saudi Arabia and America is not working, then it's going to bring lots of problems for the country um, uh, in, in the days and the weeks to come. And the deputy head of Sudan's ruling council, Malik Aga, has welcomed negotiations for a further ceasefire, but said no truce can hold until all forces are withdrawn from the capital. Is there any likelihood that this will happen? That is, that is a condition that is being set, and they have set many conditions before. They want the RSF to lay down their arms, even though there was an agreement in Jeddah. Uh, 
we, have, we haven't seen that. There's been no ceasefire. There's been no protection of civilians. But this has led to more suffering. Um, whether whether that is going to happen, uh, for now, the talks that will be pushed, they will, they will want uh, both parties to come to the table, to the table in Jeddah. I think there's going to look around and, and look way to bring these people. There has to be incentive. And remember also there are many people pushing African Union at the end, at the end of certain point will have to come in. And that is what may be happening. And they will have to push us in uh, what is next. We have, we have to agree on what ways to bring people back on the table. And uh, there has to be conditions uh, have, has to be met before any negotiations will take place. And this is looks like the South Sudanese National Army is pushing for that. And they, they are pushing really hard to make sure that RSF agrees to their terms. But uh, we understand that uh, the, uh, the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, led by Hameti. Hameti is reported to have said that he's willing to negotiate, he's willing to come back to the table. But uh, set conditions, will that, will that bring them to the table? Will that bring sort of solutions? I think time will tell um, as, as uh, days or weeks progress. Uh, and Mohammed, there have been consequences, you know, following the violence in Sudan the, in the aftermath. Uh, we've seen evacuations, countries have closed their missions there. I understand that Kenya, where you are, has also closed its diplomatic mission in Khartoum. Uh, what more do we know? And is the evacuation of Kenyan citizens complete or the closure of the embassy is just something along the line? It is not complete. Kenya announced that on Sunday it was going to close down its embassy in Khartoum, um, and that is due to escalation of, of the conflict and uh, uh, insecurity uh, in the, around the embassies and also safety of diplomatic officials. That is uh, some of the issues Kenyans are raising, and that has been raised by many um, embassies and many United Nations humanitarian organizations and uh, other independent aid agencies. That uh, is Kenya. Are there more Kenyans? Of course, there are many Kenyans, there have been many students, but that is going to complicate any evacuation process. If any Kenyan will need uh, the, the embassy services, that will not be available. That is now the challenge. Now, for those Kenyans who are trapped there, who have been finding it difficult to get out, now they have to rely on well wishers and humanitarian organizations and other African organizations that are there uh, to help them get out of the country if they would like to get out. And so closure of its mission in Sudan doesn't really mean hands off, does it? Uh, what role is Nairobi playing in the African initiatives to end the conflict uh, between Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces? This Africa regional bloc, IGAD, has given the task of mediation all these peace talks, trying to bring those parties together. That task was given to South Sudan and, and Kenya. Uh, they haven't been picking off. There haven't been lots going on in both countries because much talks and so much of the Air Force now is being concentrated by the U.S. and Saudi. Saudi is up in Jeddah. That is what has been going on. But behind the scenes, IGAD, we understand they have met today looking at the reports and what's been going on, consultative meetings and what they're discussing, just to push a little bit and see, and, and quite understandably, they must have, in a way, discussed the issue of Sudan. And Kenya has said that it's willing, really to come up and help if, if the parties are willing. And the, the willingness has to be there. And Kenya is saying that we are ready to provide the expertise to bring those warring uh, parties um, to the table and bring an end to the conflict. And back in Khartoum, on the humanitarian end, what are the aid workers doing on the insufficient food supply, even though they are concerned about their safety with, you know, some aid workers already caught up in this and they've lost their lives already? Part of the ongoing talks or trying to bring both parties together on the table I think it's much to do with also the suffering of, of, of general public and the people themselves in the country. And uh, in part, it's to secure and, and make many people feel safe. Uh, those people wish to get out, to get out, and people are able to move freely and access uh, any assistance or any humanitarian organization that will be providing uh, supplies to get those aids that they really need. But um, there's been, of course, struggle. You've just played some uh, um, organization spokesperson and the media people saying that it's been very difficult. That has been there for the last seven weeks. Has the situation changed? I think for the seven days I've been ceasefire, of course, no one was respecting that truth. But we have seen instances where um, aid were able to go in and many people at least were able to receive help and those people are trying to get out. Many have left. But much of the conflict, despite Khartoum becoming the center, 
But there's a lot of challenges that is going on in the west of the country, particularly Darfur. And that is along the border between Sudan and Chad. That's where there have been a lot of people, many people crossing. Aid agencies have been trying to say in the last, since the war began in six months that maybe there will be about 100,000, but it's just about seven weeks after the fighting. They have crossed that 100,000 100, mark. So you can you can imagine the situation, how dangerous it is. And for the for those particularly, for example, in Chad, aid agencies are finding it difficult even to provide assistance along the border in Chad. The capacity is full, they can't provide any more. But also trying to move um, um, out and trying to get close to Sudan, maybe about five, 10 kilometers to provide and help people. That is also becoming quite challenging entirely for the country. It's been a real, real challenge. But uh, many people are speaking of how many days they are taking to cross uh, to get medical aid, food and, uh, and sort of assistance. Even those who want to get out now, they're finding it very, very difficult. And if they get out, it's taking them a long days to get out to safety areas. Right. Thanks, uh, Mohammed, for those updates. Mohammed Yusuf, VOA correspondent, speaking to us from Nairobi, Kenya. And coming up after the break, the sellout show as Burner Boy makes history in London. Welcome back. The BRICS foreign ministers meeting has ended in Cape Town, South Africa, with eight new members joining the body's new development bank. These include Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, Bangladesh and Uruguay. South Africa's Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Naledi Pando, who addressed the media, says that the BRICS new development bank, or NDB, is playing a key role in advancing the developmental agenda of developing nations. Ms. Pandor was speaking at the just-concluded BRICS meeting of foreign ministers in Cape Town, where the bloc has been talk taking stock of the bank's performance, most of which has been around the loans towards infrastructure development. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Simosa, reports. The new BRICS Development Bank has grown its membership from five to eight members, and A9 is set to join soon. Host Minister Naledi Pando of South Africa said the bank has recorded impressive progress and that most of the loans secured through the bank had been for infrastructure development. She also announced that members are happy about the bank's AA+, Plus, with a stable outlook rating by Standard & Poor's. In our view, the bank has uh, recorded some really quite impressive progress. We're particularly thrilled that it's maintained uh, its very, very excellent uh, financial rating. It also has played a role, which was our aspiration when we created it, in providing support for development programs in our own countries, but in the member countries as well. We had hoped we create a dif different kind of development financial institution that really would be committed to addressing matters of socio-economic development. BRICS countries accounts for over 40% of the world's population, 20% of the world trade and 25% of the global GDP. The BROC is attracting a lot more interest. However, with Russia-Ukraine conflict, economists predict Russia's economy will contract between 8 and 16% this year, wiping out all the gains of decades of economic growth. Russia is currently facing challenges as it experiences restrictions from the SWIFT payment system. While MasterCard and Visa are impending cross-border payments, this situation raises concerns about its potential impact on the country's overall success. Ambassador at Large Asia and BRICS, Professor Anil Suklal, is advocating for the integration of cut payment systems among the BRICS countries. Uh, this came out very clearly in the message of uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, who have indicated that we, we must develop alternate systems uh, to, to the established systems. And that's happening. 
uh, to give us uh, greater autonomy and not be held hostage uh, by certain entities in terms of global financial uh, uh, payment systems and settlements. Ministers express their desire to establish their own financial messaging systems instead of relying on the Belgian-based SWIFT network. Professor Anil Suglal suggested some sort of a BRICS rating agency in order to provide an alternative credit rating system. Look, this has been on the agenda of uh, BRICS meeting uh, in the past. It's come up again and that's something also that I think will receive attention as we go forward. That uh, we are not only dependent on, on rating agencies that are based in the north that determine uh, our credit rating. Uh, we should have also our own eight rating agencies looking at this. This was actually discussed when South Africa had the chairship in 2018 and this was something that South Africa had put on the discussion table. It's still very much on the discussion table. The final suggestion here was to use the national currencies of BRICS nations for trade. From Cape Town, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. Recognized as the largest tech show on the African continent, Jitex Africa's maiden edition over the weekend in Marrakesh, Morocco, brought together tech enthusiasts with innovative solutions and disruptive ideas to tackle global challenges. Thought leaders in the field are now calling for more public and private stakeholder engagement aimed at consolidating the progress made at the various levels in the African tech ecosystem. Our correspondent, Mayo Adegoke, who represented Channels Television, brings us this report. One nation bound in freedom, peace and unity. It's Nigeria Day at the Nigerian Communications Commission booth on day two of Jitex Africa. And as policy leaders, government entities, as well as tech influencers and thought leaders continue various engagements on site, young African startup founders in attendance seize the opportunity to promote their solutions in hopes of finding global partners. Oh, it's been going well actually. I've been able to uh, onboard a, a number of uh, startups here to join the, uh, the business, as well as uh, a few investors. Had um, the governor of Lagos there also came here yesterday and actually uh, I showcased my product to him. So it's been going well. Gotten to speak with a lot of investors, partners. We've made I've made a lot of partnerships and a lot of network here. So it's been very, very interesting. And um, I hope to go back to be able to explore these opportunities that we have here to scale our business further across uh, other African countries beyond Nigeria. Many of the over 900 tech entities spread across the exhibition floor are in Africa for the first time. This is in part due to the complexities associated with the continent of 54 countries. However, stakeholders say the presence of over 30 government agencies taking part in the digital summit will lead to key policies that benefit the economies of African states. For both communications and commerce, you need trust. One of the basic things about trust is identity. How can I tell that you are who you say you are? I mean, like, in, you know, many countries have national ID cards, but you don't have a combined system that you could pull to, to, to verify that. And I mean, as a basic thing, if you can sort out the identity issue, um, our borders become more permeable in terms of people being able to travel across. Trade becomes more possible. I can trade with you out in Nigeria and me being out in Kenya without having to think, are you the true person you say you are? So that would be my main challenge, identity. Buhari, he was running for a second term in office on May 29th, 2019. It's a marketplace for solutions. A Nigerian tech content creator, Eric Okafo, who has been documenting his interesting finds, shares his experience with me. I feel like I, there's a lot of companies who are serving African market, and I didn't know they were because they are Finnish companies, French companies, um, Polish companies, like from all over the world, but they are serving Africa, and that was interesting to me because I, you know, I have a lot of information about African tech companies, but not so much from outside Nigeria that are actually supporting us in one way or the other. Um, I'll be happy to, uh, without naming them, I'll be happy to share some of those experiences. As the event carries on into the third and final day, 
there is an emphasis on the exportation of African talent to the world and how the maiden edition of Jitex Africa is accelerating economic tech advancement between the world and the continent. For Marrakesh, Morocco, Maya Wadigoke, for Channels Television. Away from technology in Senegal, the Red Cross has revealed that almost 360 people were injured in violence that broke out after the opposition leader, Usman Sonko, was sentenced to two years in prison. At least 16 people are known to have died in the clashes between demonstrators and security forces in the capital, Dakar, and Mr. Sonko's home city of Zinguinko. And reports from Libya say thousands of Egyptian migrants have been deported on foot back to Egypt. A Libyan security source says 4,000 migrants have been found during raids on human traffickers in the east of Libya. An Egyptian security source said that only about half of those rounded up were in Libya illegally and they were the only ones who'd been deported. And finally, on the program, in London, Burner Boy has won rave reviews for his historic concert, where he became the first African artist to headline a UK stadium. Some 80,000 fans watched the Nigerian star's sellout show with a set list spanning his decade-long career from early hits like uh, To Party to the anthemic last night, or last, last, beg your pardon. Uh, Bernard Boy was flanked on stage by dozens of dancers and was joined by a succession of stars, including Stormzy, Jay Huss, Dave and Popcan during the two-hour set at the grounds of West Ham United Football Club. Eddie Caddy, who represents the UK uh, Afrobeats chart show, said this isn't the first time African music is at the forefront. Well, that's the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.